The Special Investigating Unit has referred evidence in the Digital Vibes contract saga to the National Prosecuting Authority as it tries to recoup 150 million rand in payments made to the communications firm. The SIU filed papers at the Special Tribunal arguing for the payments to be declared invalid and irregular. In court papers, it painted a picture of large-scale fraud perpetrated by suspended health minister Dr. William Kieser and his associates. Joining us now is the Wits School of Governance, Professor Alex Vandenhiva, to unpack more on this issue. Dr. Alex, a very good morning. Thank you for speaking to us. I suppose where I'd like to start off is governance. What is governance? What is good governance? Well, good governance is not only a matter of conduct, it's also about the structure of a system to ensure that uh, um, a system works well and is functional. And, uh, and what we're seeing in this instance is a demonstration of the fact that there are structural weaknesses in our governance framework within government that effectively allows for cabals to coordinate with the executive of government within, also within the administrations in uh, interfering in procurement processes, which are a massive risk to South African society. So if we do not have a tight rein on government resources that are uh, allocated and the people that are working with them, if we do not have a tight rein on that, then nothing is safe in South Africa. Are there great areas in governance that allow for the levels of corruption that we are seeing in government? Surely there have to be some gray areas that allow individuals to be as, as brazen as they are. Yeah, so I don't think they're gray. I think that they're, let's say, in terms of understanding them, I think that they're now very well understood. Uh, our fundamental problem we have in South Africa is that we uh, allow for a leakage into our state structures through political parties. And political party appointments are effectively uh, permitted uh, into the administrations of government. And what that allows is people in the executive of government to be able to uh, coerce or to uh, coordinate with members of the administration who've effectively been appointed by the same political process uh, in areas such as procurement, but it can also extend to other areas which have enormous economic influence on South Africa, such as regulatory structures and bodies, um, uh, the licensing of uh, anybody in the private sector which can essentially be held back subject to sort of requirements to pay, uh, pay, pay money, etc. So there's enormous power that is concentrated and authority concentrated in the state. And if we allow this leakage, essentially what it does is it invites patronage. And what we have had and experienced in South Africa is an increasing uh, a tendency to exploit this vulnerability in the South African state. And it essentially has to be closed. And I think that the mere the extent of time that it has taken to, to address this matter of the minister and the fact that he hasn't even resigned yet or bothered to, and the fact that the officials haven't even been suspended that are clearly behaved improperly in this particular instance is a further indication of the weakness. In any normal government structure, these people would have already been fired, not suspended, but fired and removed, because you cannot have people who conduct themselves in this way in the state. And if we saw that immediacy, we would know that something was working in our governance structure. So the very slow pace of addressing this is an indication of the governance weakness that we have. Well, I suppose you talk about immediacy, and I'd like to think that if there was any immediacy, there would be nobody in government, because there is so much uh, evidence of uh, poor governance? There's massive evidence of uh, what's called irregular expenditure that's uh, uh, indicated by the Auditor General in all, virtually all provinces, except for very small amounts, for instance, in the Western Cape. And the, the, mere, the sheer scale of it on an annual basis is an indication that, there is, that it is a structural problem. And, uh, and it has to be stated, it's a structural problem to do with the ANC itself. And at the provincial level, it is very it is tied to provincial ANC structures, and at the national level, potentially to national ANC structures. And the problem is that essentially you allow a private body of people to orchestrate what occurs within the state for private gain, and that is that is a structural weakness in South Africa's democracy as well as in the governance of the state itself. And we're also seeing that the parliamentary structures, both at provincial level and at the national level fail 
to hold the executive to account. And that's because, again, these are people that are all appointed by the same party. And the current rules of the party structures allow them to penalize people if they whistleblow or if they take the appropriate action or if they behave in a constitutional manner, that will be against the interest of the political party and they can be removed. That is completely wrong and shows that that weakness needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency in South Africa. Professor, Dr. Mkiza is alleged to have pressured senior officials to appoint digital vibes for that 150 million rand contract. Now, what role does power or influence play in this whole governance puzzle? Well, the, so the power is really, uh, it, it rests within the states, uh, in the state structures which are being abused. Your ability to actually appoint people into those structures gives you immense influence over them. So there's a question as to whether the people were acting on the direction of the minister or were cooperating with the minister. And uh, at this stage, it's impossible to tell. What was clear is that some state structures did not cooperate, like National Treasury said, no, you cannot procure in this particular way. But what then happened was somebody like uh, Dr. Anban Pillay, according to what's been in the media, then, uh, then basically went through a whole process in order to kind of structurally uh, uh, organize a procurement process that resulted in a particular endpoint. So the issue is that we had senior members of the administration itself who cooperated with uh, this requirement. Now, we do not know what kind of specific instructions were given to people or how they cooperated. That's not been made public. But the, the irregular nature of the tender process itself strongly suggests a high degree of coordination. And that means that we, should, we shouldn't even be seeing these officials wandering around giving talks on, uh, on COVID and NHI, when in fact they are quite clearly improperly in their positions. So the question is, why have they not already been suspended? And the question there is whether or not they threaten to reveal further information that would incriminate people within the executive. And that's the reason why they are not fired yet. So the issue is it's already, that is already an indication of how deep it potentially goes into the system that we can't remove rotten apples the way we should. Now, before I go to my next question, the minister has been accused by the SIU of unlawful and improper conduct. Now, improper conduct suggests unethical behavior, if, if you will, but is it a crime? So the, uh, very often that uh, improper conduct is the, is the kind of the lesser offence, which is one that suggests that you shouldn't be in high office. So, yes, it might be in some instances um, uh, not criminality in itself, purely because you can't directly prove it in, in many cases. But where they're in, accusing of unlawful conduct, that is a different matter. Then they would have to have evidence that is, in fact, uh, acted uh, uh, willfully to commit a crime in government. Uh, commit some sort of fraud. But when it's improper conduct, a person should absolutely be removed in these positions because what that means is um, have they behaved in a way that has misused government resources? Um, and that can include turning a blind eye to things or pressuring people to do certain things. Um, so if they've got evidence of that, uh, just the conduct of behaving badly in looking after government's resources. You're not fit to be in government. And I think that that becomes a very important first line of protection for our state, uh, state structures. And uh, quite clearly, we are not seeing any movement at this point um, at the level, of, at government's level to act, to act on that particular aspect, which is, which is very serious. The criminal stuff will go through its own process, but the mismanagement of the state means you shouldn't be in the state. Is governance different across sectors? I mean, across government, civil society, private enterprise? And the reason I ask is because if you're in private business, your son or heir to the throne, so to speak, is involved in some of your dealings. In fact, is potentially going to take over the, the family business. We have seen a number of situations where politicians have been fingered in corruption and their immediate family too has been uh, fingered or, or, or involved. Where do you draw the line? 
So in private business, it, you're setting up a private arrangement, and where it's your own money that's at risk, it's up to you to manage it. You're at risk for that. If you've got a publicly listed company, very often you're dealing with a disaggregated range of shareholders, and that's why you have corporate governance structures and, and requirements for transparency if you want to list your company and have people buy shares in your company. And that's to protect that, uh, the shareholders from the management of the private entity from abusing uh, their ability to manipulate that organization in their own interests and then uh, run against the interests of the shareholders who have invested in the company. So that's a corporate governance design for exactly the kind of problem that we see in the state where people are looking after other people's money and other people's interests. So what you can't have is that a politician or any member of the state uh, re uh, uses the state structures to enrich their family and friends um, that, because the state structures are not there for that purpose. They are there for the, for the, the public as a whole. And when people start to do this, the public sector, the government itself, starts to become privatized. It it's essentially becomes a structure acting in the interests of individuals, um, private gain and greed and profit, not to uh, actually provide public services. So anybody in government, an elected, somebody who's part of an elected uh, structure or somebody who's appointed into government, uh, they are there looking after other people's money. And if they fail to do so, they cannot be there anymore. They have to be removed. And they should be removed instantaneously that there's sufficient evidence that they have either misappropriated funds or that they have uh, acted badly in looking after state resources. And what we're seeing is time and time again, those are the most difficult people to remove from any position of, uh, uh, of authority and power. And that is where the centre of the problem comes. And the length of time that we've seen uh, taken for action in this case is an indication of how deep the problem is. Professor Alex, my final question. A few months ago, I spoke to advocate Andy Mutibi from the SIU. And he mentioned that as many as 6,000 government officials had either been fingered in corruption or were in some way involved in corruption. Where is the checking mechanism for governance in government? Well, it should have been our, our parliamentary structures. It should be our uh, overriding general governance arrangements, like our investigative structures, like the Hawks um, and the South African Police Services, as well as the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, what's, been, what's become clear is that these structures were deliberately disabled. Um, in, and it was, it was done as a party political uh, stratagem in 2007, 2008, in order to avoid uh, the kind of action that, uh, uh, you know, the, those structures actually working. And that disablement has actually undermined our ability to hold people in the state to account. So the parliamentary structures are another account accountability mechanism, but they are a complete dead hand at the moment because of the way in which they relate to their parties. So there needs to be a fundamental restructuring of the way our democracy is organized, and there needs to be a correction and a protection from uh, political influence of our uh, investigative and our prosecut prosecutorial structures. Um, that is, we are supposedly going through a process of repairing them. But I think that it is problematic that the only structure that appears to be succeeding in investigations is the SIU and not the Hawks. So why is that happening? So that the Hawks still remains a contaminated organization that can't do its job properly. And we cannot have that going forward. Uh, we need our justice system to work, and that really becomes the uh, makes sure that the people are removed uh, expeditiously. But the problem that we have now is that we have uh, allowed corrupt people into the public system uh, to reach endemic levels, and that is just the speed with which people took advantage of the PPE procurement process shows just how um, how disabled our state is that people just saw it as a money-grabbing opportunity and nobody even worried about the possibility of, uh, of comeback. It was brazen, and it shows just how bad the problem is. Professor Alex, thank you for your time this morning.